Some of you may be familiar with a report that was just issued by the National Academies. Uh, the National Research Council of the National Academies, uh, funded by the National Science Foundation, just released a very significant report on informal science learning. And in this book, they are looking at how do people acquire science knowledge across a lifetime. And they looked in particular at all the studies reported over the last few years that supported that people learn about 9% of our time, by the way, is spent, lifelong time is spent in a formal classroom. So if we are going to have a science literate society, we really need to have many different outlets where people learn um, and can have that scientific literacy updated at changes so quickly. And the, the National Science Foundation and the academies wanted to know what works, what do we know that's out there that's been done. They developed in this book, it is available on the National Academy's website, but they developed what they called the six strands of science learning. And from these strands of learning, they talked about establishing a framework for learning in the informal setting. My contention is we could take those six strands of learning, take the word science out, and think about how they would apply to all of our spaces. The first of them, I really loved when they talked about learning in the designed environment. They talked about the designed environment as being a primary place where you could really create interest. And what they're talking about is the family, the child, whoever, who comes in and goes, oh, wow, is this ever cool? Or somebody who comes across something and says, I never knew that before. I just can't believe that. That's really interesting. We know that interest, that, that real touch point for curiosity and interest and excitement, that's what, is, what lays the groundwork for continued learning. It creates the disposition, the desire to learn and to know. And sometimes that may be all that we can do in our institutions. But I have to say, that's really quite a considerable thing to accomplish. If people, everyone who left your institution left with a sense of, this is interesting stuff, look what you have accomplished. Strand number two was really about sharing science knowledge or historic knowledge or art historical knowledge or whatever we want to, to talk about as subject matter. But that learning of the factual story is only one out of six strands of learning. I think that's really pretty amazing because it is often the one that gets our primary attention. Oh, but they, they, they can't walk through here without learning this, that in 1836 this happened and this happened and this. Sturbridge Village shares the same year with Connor Prairie, so I can play that one. Um, but no, what is it we really want to have happen? If they go out spouting like little encyclopedias, is that about learning? That's only one form of learning. And how does it tie into a much broader picture of understanding who we are in the world today? And the other four are, are interesting, and I won't go through them fully, but uh, very, very quickly, one is about identity, thinking of yourself, that they would like to see people leave with the sense, I can enjoy science. I appreciate science. I'm smart enough to get science. I see myself as a person in the world who can understand and use science effectively, not professionally, not with a PhD, but competence. And then there was reflecting on how do scientists figure out these things? How do they do what they do? And that would be true of any of the work that we do. That process, what leads to the investigation? How does the historian actually come up with this story? He didn't leave, live 400 years ago. Where does that material come from? How do, what kind of critical thinking skills are involved in doing that work? And finally, two of the last two strands were one was about actually behaving like a scientist. I can look through the microscope and see something. I can use the caliper to measure something, kind of the laboratory-like experience. And finally, and again, one of those things we all hope happens in our institutions is actually using 
scientific thinking, historic thinking, artistic thinking, that we put our own minds toward solving problems and operating through a, a nice choice of critical thinking skills, that that's a very, very important part of what we hope people learn. I think to my frustration that I've told people forever that museums teach critical thinking skills. I should probably say we can teach them. I'm not convinced that we always do. That we don't jump over that hurdle for people and present them with the answer rather than helping them explore getting to that answer. So learning goes all the way from the affect of emotional learning to being challenged to think in a different way. And if we think about learning broadly that way, then, our, then the way in which we work with our families is also going to be very deep and very broad as well.